Not everyone in the space program, of course, agrees with all of this television. It is, in their view, show business and should have no place in an engineering program. On the other hand, the price tag on the whole lunar Apollo program is $24 billion, and there's some suspicion the taxpayers think they deserve at least as much for their money. With NASA officials finding that money increasingly hard to get, they've opened up more and more of the program to television. It may be true that an engineering case can even be made, that ground controllers may spot something during one of the transmissions that will prove helpful. But Gene Cernan and the other members of this crew generally list a more basic reason for their support of onboard television. I feel very strongly, very, very strongly, that this program is one which belongs to, to you and uh, your great-grandmother and your children and the children of the people sitting out there, uh, as well as to myself. I've been fortunate enough to be able to be a direct participant in it, but I'd like to be able to, not me, but we, let me say we would like to be able to give and share part of what's going on, part of the history that's being made in, in our lifetime, in, in all of our lifetime, right now with a lot of other people. Hopefully to give other people a better understanding of what's going on, and hopefully better to share, to, to share some of that excitement that's involved. They, they can't help be but be excitement in seeing some of the things that are really happening right now. And hopefully we can do this. Cernan's enthusiasm for television is only part of a, an increased effort by NASA officials from the top down to sell their program. And it is perhaps most noticeable at Houston, where CBS News correspondent Bruce Morton is standing by at the Manned Spacecraft Center. Bruce? Well, I think uh, you're right. It is part of a more general campaign, uh, noticeable even in such grubby details as the documents that all of us down here collect. Uh, the flight plan this time contained a lot of things that reporters had been asking for in the past, uh, more specific information about distances and velocities, uh, such homey things as translations into Eastern Daylight Time instead of ground elapsed. Uh, the press kit also seems to have more information this time. And all of that, I think, indicates, uh, as do conversations with NASA officials here, a feeling that uh, the agency needs now, as perhaps it didn't in the early days, to go out and grab itself a public constituency. Appropriations, as you said, have been dwindling. Uh, there are questions in a lot of people's minds here now about where the program goes once the United States does land somebody on the moon. And uh, a general feeling that there's a new administration in, it's time to make some new friends in Washington, get some new public support. Uh, one other instance, you remember on a couple of the earlier Apollo flights, there was a good deal of controversy about so-called private conversations. Uh, one instance involving um, when uh, Rusty Schreikert was ill and there were private conversations from uh, the spacecraft to the ground with the doctors. Uh, Dr. Thomas Paine, the new NASA administrator, has said this time that there may be such conversations, but that in a general way, at least, uh, the content of all of them will be made public. And certainly this television effort uh, is one of those things. It's, uh, it's true, I think, that uh, this crew themselves are television conscious and felt a, a desire to share, but it's also true that uh, this is good public relations, and the agency... Uh, that uh, large segment of it on the ground here at Houston is just delighted with the exposure these pictures have been getting. Uh, NASA people uh, walk up to each other in the hall and say, hey, did you watch television last night? They had us on for an hour and a half, and that kind of thing. So there is, I think, a campaign, and also some feeling here that, uh, that it's working, that uh, there is more public support, beginning uh, with Apollo 8, uh, Frank Borman, uh, the, the uh, Christmas trip, and uh, that they've, they've gained some... Uh, friends in Washington. Vice President Agnew, one is told here, has become a strong supporter of the space program. So maybe it works. Bruce, uh, for all the emphasis on television for this particular flight, no final decision has been made with regard to the lunar landing itself. The color camera, of course, that we're seeing in operation is being operated on board the command module, while it is the lunar module that will actually make the historic excursion to the moon out at Grumman Aircraft, CBS News correspondent Nelson Benton is standing by with engineer Scott McCloud. Gentlemen, what's the prospect for live, in-color television from the moon? Uh, there's millions of dollars worth of equipment tied up at LAM that is flying on this flight, but uh, the Luna module itself, this flight, will not have any television. In other words, when uh, LAM separates from the command module on this flight of Apollo 10, there will be no television aboard. And when Apollo 11 goes to the moon. There will be television aboard. It will carry this camera, the one that 
was flown on Apollo 9. But Scott McCloud, uh, tell us more about the configuration for television on the lunar flight. Well, a camera similar to this one, Nelson, will be carried in the descent stage of the lunar module. But not in the cabin. Where but it can not be. in the cabin, that's correct. It has other limitations. Yes, it's black and white. So, as current plans are, David, uh, the television from the moon will will take place once the lunar module does get on the moon, and it will come back in uh, living black and white. But uh, Jim uh, Lovell on the flight of Apollo 8 told us that things were pretty much uh, black and white on the moon anyway. Yes. On the limb that is flying this time, we reported yesterday that the crew could expect no surprises. We now find out from uh, some of Scott McCloud's spies that there is a plaque mounted inside the limb. Scott, what is this and how did it happen? Well, this is a little message from the consulting pilots, uh, the last ones in the cockpit just about, to the crew when they crawl through from the command module to the LEM. This is one of the first things that they'll see. On one of the hatches, they'll find uh, Snoopy, the namesake for the lunar module, lying on top of the lunar module, receiving a message from the command module that says, darn it, Snoopy. The flight plan specifically states that, well, it doesn't go any further, but the flight plan says right now that we in Snoopy are passive, and David, we are passive. Nelson, we'll be looking ahead to uh, the remainder of this flight of Apollo 10 in a moment. The astronauts this afternoon performed a mid-course correction, a slight change in their trajectory. The first, and according to the way things look now, their last mid-course correction on the way to the moon. They are now at just about the halfway point. And in fact, this one today can't really be called a correction in the usual meaning of the word since it was planned all along. The purpose was to make a change in the lunar orbit to get a better look at the lunar landing site. Without the change, the spacecraft orbit would have been five degrees from the moon's equator. Now it is expected to be within one degree of the equator. Not only does this improve the orbit, it also provided another good test of the spacecraft engine, the engine that will put them into orbit and take them out. Tomorrow shapes up as a day like any other when you're closing in on the moon, uh, perhaps some more television later in the day. But Wednesday marks a major test as the crew really puts on the brakes for an entry into lunar orbit. The same situation that we've been in only one other time in man's history. And that was on the crew of Apollo 8, the Christmas time flight. Thursday will feature the descent of the LEM, Snoopy, to within an unparalleled 10 miles of the moon's surface. With that maneuver, we should have a pretty good idea of whether man has now ventured into the sphere of the probable rather than only the possible. That's the story. David Schumacher, CBS News, Space Headquarters, New York. This has been a CBS News special report, The Flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Next Apollo update on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. This is CBS. All stations, this is Master Control, New York. This can be built 1 o'clock p.m. current New York time. Apollo status report may not run the entire half hour. I repeat, the Apollo status report may not run the full half hour. Be prepared to fill. as it has been through the ages, desolate and without life. This is, however, only an artist's simulation. We are, once again, about to see the real moon, and within hours, man will, for the second time in recorded history, arrive over the lunar surface. This is a CBS News special report, The Flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by...
Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent David Schumacher. Well, this is the day the joking stops for Apollo 10, although with a team of Stafford, Young, and Cernan, you can never be sure. For two days now, they've gone through the serious business of flight corrections, injections, and dockings with the appearance of concern you expect from men waiting to catch a commuter train. But at this moment, 9,205 miles from the surface of the moon, they're getting ready for the second entry into lunar orbit in the history of man. That will happen just about three and a quarter hours from now.